Welcome to the Soulful Sound Podcast. This podcast is about celebrating the leaders, teachers, and coaches who guide fellow humans to connect, heal, and discover themselves so they can express their gifts into the world. I am Simone Niles, a coach, sound healer, vocalist, and author. Thank you for being here with me today. Hey everyone, welcome to a new podcast episode on the Soulful Sound Podcast, where I'm joined by the beautiful Aaron Michael, who is the author of Optimal Sex Life, creator of Bedroom Masterclass, and Sex and Intimacy Coach. He is also the founder of Suction Sex, a new method for the embodiment of penetrative sex. Aaron is sought out for his innovative approach to resolving intimacy issues and optimizing individuals and their relationships. Welcome, 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 Aaron. So happy to have you here. Finally, we are together, finally. Thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure. Well, you know, I'm so excited to have you here. I know you really well, and you know how turned on I am by the work that you do. And so I felt it's time to share it with others. So I want to jump in first and foremost, just to know a little bit more about your story and how you began to work as a sex coach, where you came from and where you are now. Let's talk about that first. Well, everything that I've learned has come from primarily hands-on learning. I have been an avid, mm, <laughs> what do you call it, a fascinate. I've, I've had a fascination with massage since mm. I was young. I helped my mother work with her neck. I've also helped my own self as well as teammates with sports injuries. And that was just a lot of just learning to listen with one finger. So I guess if I were to have a, a gift is the ability to see with and communicate a lot with touch. And as that has then developed, a big jump was with uh, my former wife that she actually, when we became married for not just physical reasons, but actually like psychological as well as physical reasons based off of the environment and the relational dynamics started to shut down and actually begin to manifest things that were more such as like we're talking like you know and in, in for instance in denmark when you get married uh you then have a certain time period where you kind of like have kids and there's a certain structure to life and if sex all of a sudden is supposed to go into that but that doesn't really align with what you're wanting mm -hmm has a certain physical manifestation, which then corresponded with what I was studying with my master's at university, which was understanding the relationship of the mind and that it's embodied and the things that you do to the body have psychological impact, but also the psychological takes impact and will show up in different ways in the body, such as pain and numbness. And this becomes very important around the issue of sex and sexuality. And then that started to develop um, from relationship coaching that I had done, helping different people deal with anxiety or maybe shyness when it came to more of like the pickup type of world. And how then does this communication, how does then my academic background where I really looked into attachment theory and how this gets embodied in yes. terms of sex then turns into forget about just going half the distance, which is becoming aware of the pains that we have, but actually then like taking that next step and looking at how we can then begin to optimize. This is actually where I found most people have their biggest fears mm. is how do we start to optimize ourselves for pleasure, deal with whatever shame or guilt or lack of deservedness that we may have, and even the fear of being too much and what happens if we then allow this to... Uh, guide us? Will it hijack or sabotage us instead mm. of actually taking us to the goals that we want? Do you feel called to use your voice and sound in a healing capacity? Learn how to use your voice therapeutically to facilitate healing and well-being. Whether you want to go deeper in your own healing journey or facilitate others in theirs, this training is for you. This online training runs over five weekends and offers theory, practice, resources, and support on your path to becoming a qualified sound healer and for your personal healing journey. 
And so this really is, and that is a very quick <laughs> way of speaking about how this progression happened. And I think the biggest thing and some of the reasons why I started then to work as a sex coach was this year period where I was then giving away different types of dearmoring sessions is what I was calling it then resensitization is another way to look at it dearmoring has some of the implications that it is a psychosomatic practice meaning that it addresses the psyche as well as the physical but helping people be able to let go of pain numbness especially around the genital areas and then also stepping away from being conditioned to avoid the things that they don't want actually moving into being conditioned towards the things that they do want and then working with couples and and helping them and that sort of then just continued to progress as then i also started to meet some really great allies i also had an opportunity to work on an app and see the different ways that this these messages can get out to the world because ultimately I did not want to be just staying or talking to people in either like let's say a very tantric community or the yoga community or the spiritual community I also didn't want to just be speaking to those in pain but I'd like to be looking at and the things that I'm doing now are talking to those in the medical community those that are doing research as well as academia but then also stepping back and really working again one-on-one -on -one in yeah. workshop scenarios in teams as we look at health holistically and then finding well where does pleasure actually take its role and even what is that role and being yeah. able to vitalize energize ourselves our relationships and those around us oh what a full response i love it there's so much that i can pull from that i want to talk a little bit about um you spoke about the armoring and resensitizing all these things i'm going to talk about that piece but before that i just want to kind of reflect that i love the round the kind of cycle that you went through with touch with hands-on being able to understand the body understand what's going on psychologically and i will go as far as saying even energetically this is the space that i work in a lot that we can't separate those parts right we're all in, in it's intertwined it's all you know coming together and it's beautiful that your journey started with touch started with the site the psyche and understanding how you can bring awareness into the body that way because we know a lot of the times that as you said the fears and the in the issues and challenges that arise around sex are not always just physical very often it's it's not and then there are the issues that you also deal with which is pain and discomfort and numbness and so it's such an embodied and holistic way i love that talk to me then about the the armoring and and resensitizing part just talked a little bit about what that is and how you help people do that well, often there's a relationship now between the psychic blocks that we might have around embracing our pleasure and psychic, I mean, our mental blocks, let's say, or that which we typically think of as the brain or our thought mechanism by psyche, then I mean, a lot of the things that kind of appeal to our sense of self or our ego. Yes. Um, with the as well as the physical correspondence. So a lot of times, for instance, there is a correlation between a history of pain, as well as then a psychological feeling of anger or frustration, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there's typical ways that we can start to actually use our body, our voice, our movement, and be able to go through that and actually transform one into the other. And that process is that of dearmoring. Now, it is called dearmoring traditionally because it was seen as if we would as we go through life, we have things that happen to us that we don't necessarily want. And so we have a posture that we will assume to defend ourselves. Yes. You know, maybe that's even a posture to close in and make ourselves small so that we're not being noticed so that we don't have to defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. It also is the word choice that we use, but there's this character that we adapt, this identity that we bring out. And as we learn to protect ourselves or cover certain things up, this could be seen or it was labeled as character character armor. Now, yeah. the thing that's interesting, and we're talking um, here about Wilhelm Reich's work in the book Character Analysis, and this is just giving some history, I guess, if people are interested into this, everyone's viewership is their listenership yes. is very different. <laughs> but um, I know that you're, you're a geeky nerd. So yes, exactly. <laughs> you know me that. well. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, in character analysis, though, he was talking about people then would start to protect these different areas of their body um, mm -hmm. or have certain postures that if the physical tension that was sort of unproportionally there, given any kind of physical reasons, because was, he was saying he was postulating that it was a psychological reason when he would then relieve that tension by pressing into it, having them breathe. Now, there is very specific techniques that he would yeah. go through to do this. And then you would have a release of the physical struggle as well as the psychological. And so what I was noticing, and then when I would be doing these dearmoring sessions or resensitization sessions or optimization, wherever the person really is at in that spectrum of numbness, which often shows up with boredom, mm -hmm. or it could be um, fear and anxiety has a tendency to show up with antsiness, um, also the kind of uh, the immediate knee-jerk reaction of resistance or pushing away and no. Yeah. So these different types of things, when they become resolved, now you have the ability to transform that boredom and the numbness into excitement mm -hmm. and adventure which are some of the easier things than when you go into a relationship to share with a partner. And the more that you can resolve and work through these things on your own level, the better prepared you're going to be. And I'm not going to say that all of a sudden you go into a relationship where everything's perfect. It's the better prepared you are to then handle that all yes. <laughs> on the relational level, which is normally a greater challenge, but also can be a much greater reward. And you'll also be setting yourself up to not be finding the perfect one because that's what you want because the word want means that you actually have an absence of it in your life yes. you mm -hmm. want for something yes. versus being that change and attracting it into mm -hmm. your life mm -hmm. we're much more like musical instruments when we tune ourselves we put out a resonance in music that is going to bring those in that same orchestra to want to come together and make music with us Yes, I love that. I mean, I talk a lot about this in my sound healing field, which is very much the same. You use sound and music and resonance and vibration, but that, yes, when we are in tune with ourselves and we bring that balance and equilibrium back home and we start there, then it does, without without us having to search for, it does have an impact and a ripple effect in that vibration and frequency in others. And I, and I take this across every area of life, right? You know, whatever you desire, you call it in by embodying that and being that. And I notice that in my life, anything that I think, oh, I want more of, or I want more of, I realize, ah, I'm separ separating myself from the yes. thing that I want. So rather shifting that perspective to I am, or I am embodying, or I'm being, or I have, it is already done those kind of things really make such a difference so i love that you are first and foremost bringing it home so today i was thinking it would be really cool and i think we've already kind of organically done that looking at that kind of inside out approach right you're talking about how it's affecting beings and then how it goes out and then affects others so before i go into relationship which i'm so excited to know about let's let's get some context so tell us what is suction sex what is that? <laughs> Tell me all about suction sex. All right. So in three very simple ways, it is one, understanding that sex is not one directional, but bi-directional. That changes a lot. When we can start to understand that, all of a sudden, you might be understanding how you could use a limp penis because you don't have to just push in. You can actually... Yeah will come backwards and create suction. But a big one as well is for the person on the receiving side that your orifice and not just your mouth <laughs> can yes. be like a mouth and to bring something in. And that's actually much more intuitive than trying to push something down your throat. And yes. the same way then you can do this with your vagina or your anus. And even understand that will change the way that you give a blowjob. I imagine yes. we're allowed to say these words on on your on your Oh, podcast. you are. You can say whatever you want on my podcast. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, now the once you understand first that concept that one it's not just one directional but bi-directional also too the way that you embody or go about finding more sensation as opposed to creating friction you are orienting yourself around suction and to get an idea of what the difference of that is you can take a finger you can place it in your mouth and move it in and out as fast as possible <laughs> And that's going to create a certain amount of sensation. But when you do that same thing, 
and you add the sucking yeah. mouth, yes. all of a sudden there is way more sensation for the finger, but there's also way more sensation as well for like the, mouth. the mouth. And then the last and third thing is, is that you will start to find ways to increase suction on the physical level, on the mental arousal level. There's a whole way of seduction of using, it will influence the way you even want to approach kink or whatever, because it starts to really speak about, well, how do we embody yes. the different qualities of love, lust, romance, commitment that we want to bring into that relational sphere, but not just with our partner, but also with ourselves. So again, I would recommend from a learning perspective to explore these things just as much in your own self, build that sexual confidence, build that repertoire <laughs> or rapport with yourself, as well as the repertoire of tools. So that way, then you'll come from a different space to be able to share with a partner, invite them into something. Mm. Yes. And I know that you have a lot of um, trainings and things around this. So all the physical things and those aspects that people are wanting to learn, the techniques, as you say, I won't go into that yet, but I'll ask you about it later. But what I want to touch on, because I love the way you even in that word invitation that you've just used um, and also bringing it to breath, because we don't force a breath in right it's something that is that inhale is actually an act of suction right with the diaphragm going down the rib cage and intercostal muscles expanding that is a natural suction that we have in our body and it's an invitation as you said bringing the parallel to bringing vitality and energy into the body so i love 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 that and i want to talk a little bit about that side if i may because i want to bring it into relationships in, in a moment okay well one of the areas we think of, and it used to be, if you look at old anatomy charts, here's again a part of nerdiness, but yes. you'd hear about the urogenital diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And now they said, well, this is just a bit of fascia that is dividing you know, your excretive system versus your reproductive system. Forget about the pleasure system, though. That's the part that I want to talk about is looking at how, as a pleasure system, that area, which is, you could generally say, kind of the pelvic floor, if you are taking a breath in and that is expanding down the same way that the diaphragm expands down and you see the lungs fill, yes. this is what, it's not air, but blood will actually fill up those vestibular bulbs, which are the, the two things that look like lungs when you see the kind of popularly drawn clitoral legs and the glands, there's these two yes. bulbs that look like lungs under there. Well, that, when you actually can lower that your genital diaphragm, the pelvic floor, that could be by actually stimulating from the inside out um, by breathing in, pushing out the pelvic floor. There's lots of ways to support that mechanism so that everything, not just here or in your stomach expands, but that actual pelvic floor expands on the in-breath. And this will naturally give a rock to the body. And this is something that we have kind of untrained ourselves to do. If you watch a child breathe, everything's expanding. Yes. But at some point, we get trained either from exercise that we have to squeeze as we inhale, or that we're sitting on the edge of the chair and we're kind of collapsed in. And so we're always actually holding ourselves a little bit. Yeah. And the only way to breathe is to squeeze and pull up. There's lots of different th reasons why we've sort of untrained that, but the ability to actually use that whole expansion and the yeah. same way we yawn and everything open up that the that the, the vagina, the anus can do this. And this isn't just for people on receiving. This is just kind of like a general maintained practice yes. of allowing that body to reach its full expansion and stretch and then relaxing this is going to remove a lot of tension that can build up in these areas naturally. So in one sense, we're continually de-armoring or resensitizing ourselves or staying connected with sensation ultimately yes. to that which is around us by feeling our whole body and perceiving reality through everything. So this is the kind of cognitive science part where we have the brain, we have the body, and these things are the mind is embodied. So we hear about the embodiment movement. Well, to be embodied means that your entire body is a thinking, mentalizing, uh, processing information part of you that isn't just the brain. And yes. then from that perspective, we stay connected out into the world. And the way that we can start to do that 
um, just with ourselves is really, again, through that breath and getting our pelvic floors so that they're not stagnant, but having that very nice just mm. expansion. I mean, we could even just take a breath right here and just feel what it feels like in your body to do yes. this. So I always do the opposite, what most people do, which okay. is I want you to squeeze as if you're stopping your inhale mm -hmm. and then take a deep breath in and increase that squeeze. And pull your stomach in and then ah, relax. Now it gives a certain amount of sensation and sort of hyper focuses a lot of attention to that area. But yes. I want you to do a different one now, which is to just push out your pelvic floor as if you were trying to increase your urinary stream just lightly. Mm -hmm. And then with that push, I want you to just breathe into that area you're pushing and inhale and feel the expansion there and uh, vibrate and relax it out. Mm. Now, it might be difficult to get the mechanics of it if you're used to always doing it the opposite way, but I know yourself as a breathing and voice specialist, this is can be second nature to you, but I would like you to describe what's the difference in sensation for you when you do that second breath. Yeah, I mean, for me, there is a, first of all, I feel an overall energetic expansion Mm -hmm. um it feels when i when i'm pushing down that urinary stream as if i'm wanting to to kind of push down and i expand there feels like there's more space and mm -hmm. there's also then a, an energetic line that goes straight down through my body and i can feel that also going down into the earth i can feel almost like that thread coming all the way through which is really beautiful i love how you give both that there's a physical sensation that's happening. There's mm -hmm. also an energetic shift that happens. Yes. There is also a psychological shift as well that of being in the sense of like openness or going into receiving or even a present. Yes. Surrender, but yes, also being very present. Imagine now if you start to breathe together as a partner, and this really gets into mm. sort of one of the things that I've been bringing forward. If we go beyond just suction sex, which is a new way to revolutionize the experience of penetrative sex, but we think about relationships and the importance of embodied love. How do we start to actually embody things that typically are ideas, such as we hear be present? Mm -hmm. be more honest be yeah. more responsible how do we actually embody that what does that mean as an act when you're having sex because yeah. the more that we can start to embody these attributes in the sexual arena it's actually going to help us and support us to do it outside of the sexual arena because again there is not this sexual spiritual mental body um separation, separation. in fact the separation when it's there is showing that there is dissonance. So this yes. is actually a sign that something's out of balance. So we bring it back to balance by actually having there be congruence behind it. And mm. the fact that most people are emulating what they've seen and what they've seen is pornography, which yeah. gives some education in terms of, hey, there's a whole world of possibilities out there around sex. However, unfortunately, what most people are seeing, though, are performances yes. as opposed to experiences. Yes, yes, yes. That's a whole that's a whole topic that we can go into. And we I know you and I have had the conversation as well about the sounds that people make, how different those embodied sounds are when they're yeah. real and connected, as opposed to also what we hear very often in, in pornography. So I understand. And what is awesome is that listening to especially the, the former part of what you were describing, just kind of changing a few words. It's exactly what what we would be teaching from a singing perspective and a sounding perspective mm -hmm. that can connection with breath and the body so as you're speaking i'm like yes yes and more yes does that mean that singers are just better at being connected in sex <laughs> i'm gonna throw that out there for all the singers who are gonna just put their hand up and claim it i think but that's that's really beautiful um and okay so here's the question that i have because you're talking about pleasure we're talking about owning our own having responsibility for our own and then being able to partner with other having that balance with ourselves, and then feeling much more um, in a space of attracting the balance in other. So let's just talk a little bit about self pleasure. Now suction sex, you spoke about it specifically around penetration and, and you're talking a lot in the context of other. 
if there is someone who wants to have this experience and learn about suction sex, is there anything that they can do in their own self-pleasure practice that maybe prepare them for the experience of, of suction sex with someone else, for example? Absolutely. There is a whole lot of information that's been created on just this. But in general, if you are, let's say you have a penis, you're going to be stimulating with your hand as opposed to just going harder and faster and only squeezing. Think about, well, what are the ways that you can create suction between your hand, between yourself? And that could be stroking away. It could be cupping over the head and actually using um, some more lubrication, not just to create more slide, but to actually allow to have a suction seal between the kind of inside of your palm, the head of the penis. So there's just going to be, also, it could be that you are using more of a grip and holding and then using your body to reverse away from the hands as opposed yes, directional you said hands. yes and mm -hmm. so these are a lot of different things now as well you could be including the way of using your pelvic floor breath as well during the sexual experience because you'll find out later this isn't something that i think many people talk about but just by squeezing your pelvic floor it creates this sort of energetic shooting out mm -hmm. and, but at the same time it causes the penis to retract and aim up so it has this very interesting different like kind of oppositional dynamic whereas if you push out inhale and push it kind of creates this dilation that you're sort of feeling in the yeah. body which can create a lot of suction energetically even though the penis itself will then have a tendency to lengthen outwards right. and go deeper and then this is going to match what's happening with the cervix so then on the female and or the person who if you have a vagina let's say yeah. or whatever title you want to use yes, um, you're going to you're going to be using a stimulation even from let's say once you've been aroused to then bring your hand into you so as opposed mm -hmm. to your hand or the vibrator or the dildo or whatever it is that you're using as opposed to that being the thing that's active and stimulating you yes. you're going to actively use your body so it could be like a suction cup um uh, dildo for instance if you want to get used to doing this with uh something that isn't your own hand but mm -hmm. as well it could be keeping your hand more steady and learning to rock and, the body your, to the hand. and actually twerk away and stimulate and this is a big thing from the inside out blood goes this way <laughs> into yeah. that area as opposed to us which we try and stimulate out to then draw blood to go there instead if we actually with our body motion uh both with the one if we're using the finger to assist us in the internal stimulation which means yes. doing these type of motions on the inside while also learning to time and rock your body and really using that pelvic floor breath to actively mm -hmm. open and then relax and bring in or actively open and then actively pull in and just playing with these pelvic floors these would be the general things that i would have you do in your own self practice yeah. so that way then you can start to emulate that with a partner by either taking your pleasure or surrendering into it which in both of these cases are if you're taking your pleasure it's you and this is something i've noticed that that women a lot of times can struggle with is taking their pleasure where they're doing an action that's actually for their own pleasure mm -hmm. versus having to do it for their partner's pleasure or the ability to then surrender meaning that they go into a more inactive state to receive pleasure that's really aimed and geared for them yes. whereas for guys a lot of times they can confuse giving pleasure which is doing something but actually for the other person we have ideas of what the other person might want but if we can't really accurately read their body or we think that they want it just the way we do we end up actually taking instead yeah. of giving which creates a very big mismatch yes. in the relationship and in fact if you have not been shown 
that you can or if you have not been received in a way that you're giving actually like brings the other person pleasure and benefit then it's going to be that much more difficult for them to go into a place of your partner to go into a place of allowing because they won't necessarily trust you to know how to take care of what it is that they want to where they actually get to such a place of being satisfied and generous that they're just like oh my god do whatever you want to me and do it for your own pleasure because that can be very hot but so there's like there needs to be this dynamic there. And this is typically where a lot of mismatch starts to happen with intentionality of who the pleasure and how the pleasure even is for and being able to kind of get out of that stuck brokenness so that these things become more fluid and dynamic is ultimately where we'd like things to go. Yeah, I mean, that is that is beautiful. And also, you know, you're speaking about that reading each other. And, and, and that's a beautiful thing. Talk a little bit more about that. Because obviously, there is an art to that in itself. If there were just a few tips that you could give people to just kind of really sense and read into what it is that their partner's body's asking for. That can be verbal, of course, but it's a lot of it's nonverbal. What are some of the things that would be lookouts for them to go, okay, I'm sensing that this is this might be what they're asking for, even if they're not speaking it out? Well, I love this question because it was something that um i was doing a workshop and this came to me where i was having people they were partnering up and they were just there to simply receive as well as feel what it's like to give or to receive a yes and a no so we would be paired up in front of each other and you would ask whatever question it was that you actually wanted let's say and then the other person would just say yes or they would just say no and you'd feel what does that impact have on you as well as then what is the impact for the person saying yes and saying no depending off of whether it was true or not or but just feeling okay what does it feel like when doing the answer is part of the exploration well there was someone there that was so blocked that they're like i can't even do this exercise because i have so many issues around saying yes or no to things Mm -hmm. and it really got me to think well okay well how do we start to explore that if we go without our words yes and so what came of this then and this is again why i always speak about my greatest teacher and learning is the benefit of all the people all the sessions that i've worked with because i learn from everything from life and i think that there's such a richness that happens when it comes from personal experience that it goes beyond what you'd maybe find in a textbook and yes. this sort of birth something around consent most people understand the idea of consent but they don't understand the embodiment of consent mm. and what i mean by that is that if you get asked a question if you think about what is the right answer you should say versus what is the actual answer that I feel from my body, whether you decide to go with that feeling or not, but at least knowing what you honestly feel is something that a lot of people skip over. So I would speak about the importance of embodiment and consent. It's very simple. If you go into a place of yes, opening up your body, exposing all the different vulnerable, vulnerable areas kind of along that midline. Imagine when you're just you're going for the biggest hug of your life. It's maybe yeah, whoever, it could be grandma's hug, it could be your pet, it could be yourself, whatever that feeling of opening mm-hmm. towards the hug, you're coming in towards, you're opening up that midline. This is your body's natural state of yes. Now, I would encourage people just to go into, pull the shoulders back, roll them back, actually roll your thumbs out, allow the legs to open because they're just as much a part of this and be in that open state. And what does that feel like? Is that a general feeling of comfort? Is that a general feeling of like being good? Does this different emotions come up? You can ask yourself different types of questions, but bring yourself into that state and see, does this actually feel congruent with it, with yes. what I'm wanting? And even if it's a person that sits there and says, if you want to hear about self-practice, your partner goes to you and says, hey, do you want chicken for dinner tonight? Take a moment, actually breathe in, open yourself up, imagine the chicken like how does that feel to me as opposed Mm -hmm. to oh no i had chicken last night or no we shouldn't have it here whatever we have this in the fridge instead but just think okay well what do i actually feel like having and then from there you can also do the opposite which is where you're just as much as you're important 
that you can go into your yes is the ability and importance to be able to express your no. When you know that your no is can be trusted, received, and celebrated, you're going to be much more willing to really embrace and know what your yes is because you're never being pressured for it. As yeah. well as the yeah. receiving side, you're going to be super excited because you know you can trust the person's yes. Yeah. But this exercise though, of opening yourself and closing yourself as a check-in on what it is that you're feeling, and it could be simply just taking your hands and going here or there, or maybe even realizing you're a bit like this, which mm -hmm. is a maybe, Yeah. then you just take your time. But feeling into your yes and your no and embodying it is going to one, put you in touch more with it, but it's also going to give your partner such rich information that then you will both be able to read each other a lot more yeah. because you're in an information rich environment as opposed to an information poor environment, which is what happens when we go into like freeze, but then we can maybe pretend like, oh no, I'm just surrendering in pleasure, but you're actually rather frozen, frozen there. <laughs> yeah way to get unfrozen mm. is to move and moving helps you get unstuck as well emotionally so you can feel your way through it as opposed to trying to think your way through it which means in sex you're going to actually be moving towards the things that you like yes. as opposed to going into your head and having to either fantasize about what you would like or ignore the present moment to bear through what you yeah. don't like yeah, of course. I love that. And I, I love that you took it to food, right? Because I often go there when I, I teach a lot of workshops on boundaries. And it's often what's a yes and a no, like when you're creating a boundary for yourself. And one of the things that I often talk about is if someone comes to you and thinking about the most amazing dish, your favorite meal, and it's on a plate right in front of you, and they say, would you like this? Our natural tendency is to lean in and to open up. And that's a mm, yes, I I'd love this juicy mango, which I love, right? Equally, if they put something on the plate that is just completely something you will never let pass your lips if you can help it, you're gonna, oh, no thanks, you know? And it's such a subtle movement, but yes and no is often uh, pushing back, pushing away resistance, contraction. Yeah. And then this, this yes is this opening and this expansion, this coming forward, right? So teaching this, I mean, again, I know the work that you do, but I love the way you're describing it because that parallel of what you're, talking about can be used in general, right? For boundaries and the yes and no for anything, which is what you keep saying. You you focus on the pleasure and, and intimacy and sex, but that is what then drives everything else in your life. That you, all the decisions that you make, all of the congruence and really understanding and taking responsibility for yourself in all ways. So well, I wanna keep pointing can, that out there. Well, and another thing is that we can all of a sudden start to trust our body as a true antenna of what it is that we're receiving and giving as opposed to that mind body or even a lot of times the spiritual body separation mm -hmm. that our body is something that blocks our spiritual progression so we're going to reject sexuality because it'll distract us from this kind of higher wider loftier purpose as opposed to seeing that these things are integrated if you look at the major religions there's a reason why there's such an importance and even judgment placed around going askew sexually well if you have that much judgment on it then well where is the importance of the sacredness and how do we bring that out and a big part of this yes and this no isn't that we look at the no in fact i was thinking of an exercise here yes. that i would love to see if you were you would have a full range of music and people could lay and go into receptivity and just feel their bodies opening and closing not as oh my gosh i have to fear the response of doing a no or fear the response of showing my yes and being seen in that, but instead noticing that this is a way that we can actually self-regulate whatever it is that we're feeling so that we have a robust nervous system so that if we hear this very shocking music, I can imagine some of the stuff you would play, yes. you know, maybe it's music that's very much in dissonance or whatever, that they could go into that no state, feel very comfortable in it, but then also feel when it shifts into this more yes state, because what we want is a fluidity and an ease of fluidity of these variety of the spectrum of response. So yes. that way we know any situation we'll be able to handle comfortably and confident, as opposed to what happens is, is that when we're in a state of fear, we think of the two most extremes in different ways that this could go this way or that way, and it's so extreme, I can't handle it. 
-hmm. that then we become fearful and we have anxiety in the body. So again, how we counter fear and anxiety is by confronting things that bring some fear and anxiety to us and then being able to use our breath as well as touch to help regulate. And that could be with a partner, for a partner, or for ourselves to then bring ourselves into a place of relaxation and calm and noticing, okay, wow, these things that were actually quite scary for me can be quite exciting and delicious if I learn to move through them. And a big part of that is having the ability to self-regulate and then the experience of sharing that with somebody that doesn't actually trigger what happened in the past and gives you possibility in the present. Mm. <laughs> Mm, I love it. Thank you. Oh my goodness. So delicious. So I listening to one of your conversations um, recently, I was, you know, checking out some of your conversations online and you used the words bringing playfulness and curiosity and art back into sex. So because you're talking about this now, I just feel that's a really lovely segue into this. Talk to me about that. How can we bring those elements into ourselves and, of course, also a partner experience, that playfulness and curiosity and art, an interesting choice of words? Well, I believe it would be very similar to the way that you would introduce this to a musician, a singer. There's those that can be extremely technical and have everything, you've the metrics to the cadence, they really look great on a, a sheet of paper. But then when it comes to actually bringing those notes to life, the ability to experiment to round corners and allow things to also have sharpness and the pause and to just be playful and adventurous with that as you start to experiment and practice um, in your personal time as a singer as well as collectively let's say if you are in an ensemble or a orchestra or whatever it is where you're in a group setting all of a sudden a choir for instance mm -hmm. then you can look at well if you can do the same thing then in terms of sex and the act of sex and how you then begin to not just embody the psychological parts but also to just becoming free in your movement mm -hmm. you know as opposed to just looking at the in and out also now you have a big part of suction sex as well as the pause which gives the ability to bring rhythm and yeah. cadence all of a sudden when it starts to explore different types of rhythms and beginning just even that in itself mm. starts to change that spectrum of what you can physically do but as well as in the sense of when you look at how you train a singer to yeah. go to notes and to do rhythms that actually challenge them that they couldn't do before to the point that they become very comfortable with going there all of a sudden broadens that toolbox and you could look at it as a technique and maybe they have to learn a technique but what they're really getting though is a tool to unlock the full spectrum by which music and art can live yes. through them and express in your case with singing or in another case with the act of sex and relating. Yes. Oh, I love I love that you drew the you, you know draw the parallels between that and you know it's interesting because a lot of the work that I do still in the music industry is mostly about the offering and the expression and the presence and less about the technique even though I'm a technician and I spoke a lot and taught a lot in that arena and one of my clients just yesterday um, has this really big gig in LA and one of the last things I said to her just before letting her go off to get ready was now remember that people want to be touched. Mm. If you can go out there and be your authentic self and free and open and present and just shine, the, the note that isn't perfect will not even be heard. It's all about feel that feeling, heart, that heart connection and that connection in general, and even in a music setting. So I can just bring that back into working with a partner in that intimate space that yeah, your your technical um, abilities might not be up to scratch yet, but there's also the connection and the heart centered openness and intimacy. And you are a sex and intimacy coach. So can we slant a little bit more into what intimacy is what that piece in that experience could be and uncover? 
Well, intimacy, the Latin root of that means intimare, which is the impression we leave on each other. And I love how you mm. talk about the effect of voice. And you also talk about touch, because I will say that a person's voice is often their very first touch, yes. their very first point of contact. Yeah. And the beauty of voice is that it literally touches yourself from the inside out, mm. but it also touches the other person in a way that actually creates a resonance or not within them and touches them from the inside out and penetrates and goes through as sound waves. Yeah. So if we think then about the range that a person, you said the ability to um, make contact with intimacy to other people. Well, if we think just in terms of pitch mm -hmm. or where is the voice resonating inside of the body, all of a sudden we look at tones and frequencies and realize that we can literally touch different parts of our own bodies as well as other people. And yes. so by doing that act of singing and increasing that range of expression, and then if you could carry that range of expression as well to a freedom of expression within the bed, think of what you would be touching. Now, if you want to get very practical so that people kind of don't hear just the abstract nerdy part yes. is think about the, or just don't think, listen to and feel the tone of a high how it resonates and buzzes in the head and if we're comfortable talking from this position then this is where we're going to be spending a lot of our embodied time and we might even notice that a lot of people that talk they're going to especially in academia will even speak all the way from up here and our sex in porn is ah, 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 yeah. up here. Oh, 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 those really high pitched things <laughs> But yes. You'll notice sometimes this more ah, uh, or when I listen to you speak, I feel a mm -hmm. lot of this ah uh, tone yeah. as you then speak from the heart, and even mm -hmm. our emotions when we say ah, I, I get it ah yes yeah that literally ah uh, is a resonance in the chest. So where are we speaking from? Where are we existing? If we listen to ourselves, if we listen to other people and knowing that we can actually change those tones and then help yeah. bring people more towards their heart, more towards our head, as well as a self internal practice. And mm -hmm. the one tone that we don't often hear inside of sex is that almost animalistic sound when you you're you listen to yourself and you're like, I mean, have you ever had sex so good that you're like, who's making these sounds? And <laughs> what is this like? <laughs> gotta record this and sample it <laughs> yes, exactly and a lot of those happen to be very animalistic guttural mm, yes uh, 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 sounds and so yes same way uh 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 feel where that vibrates uh, yeah. Yeah. uh is at the pelvic floor now a lot of people when I take them through using vibrations and feeling where the uh, ah, e is, most will feel kind of at the ah chest area, but these oh, lower, sounds yeah. down lower, there normally is a big disconnect there. And yeah. this is important because where are we touching ourselves? Where are we embodying? Are we embodying that full spectrum? Well, one hint is, where is our voice resonating? Because mm. if our voice is only resonating here, that means we're only getting touched here or below when someone goes to grab our genitals. But we will likely not be very open to that because this part has been closed down, locked off, and we need to do something like alcohol, drugs, or make a date or something, dress up to mm -hmm. have that big shift as yeah. opposed to maintaining a state of openness and being yes. able to flow fluidly in a robust sense of places. And that mm -hmm. comes by actually allowing that voice to always be stimulating everything. So that way we're more of a water cauldron bubbling. And now there's different things we can do as well in terms of the mental aspects and yes, the fantastical parts, but just getting in touch with our voice, we might notice that sometimes we become resistant to those tones mm -hmm. because we actually aren't comfortable going there for 
X, Y, Z reasons that could That's be anything it. from culture to family upbringing to a bad experience, trauma, or whatever. All the things, the conditioning, yeah. the learn, all of this. So <laughs> a lot of unlearning and relearning and reconditioning. It doesn't have to be big stuff. Sometimes it's the very yeah. small little things as well yeah. that add up over time. Amazing. I, I oh, You're speaking to my heart right now. All of this yummy stuff is just like, yes, 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 opening to all of it. I want to know just um, a couple tips, like what is one of the, maybe one, one technique or the number one technique for you that you could give a person right now to revolutionize their sex life? What's that? What would that be? Well, I think if, since, since we can't suspect that everyone's going to be with a partner, is the ability to use your voice uh, and hit some of those deeper tones while also breathing and expanding out that pelvic floor during a sexual exploration. And notice what kind of um, physical sensations you're going through. And then if you wish to take another step, look at, well, what kind of fantasies come up and see what tendencies in those fantasies are there. Is it power play? Is it anticipation? Is it keeping or breaking rules, being rewarded or punished? Is it maybe novelty? Is it the uh, desire to have a very particular environment that's exciting? Or is it something just intensely sexual where you go from being ar not aroused to then being hyper aroused and finding out what are these kind of erotic blueprints for the mind that mm -hmm. then we can both on the physical as well as mental level really get to know ourselves mm. from a body perspective of what it is that's going to bring me sensation, what happens when I get this sensation, and what can I do with it in a way that actually serves me to bring more pleasure in my life. And frankly, that would be the same thing you would do then in a relationship, but just you're doing it with the person. So there's some communication about that, both in embodiment, but also with the verbal aspect. But if you did a good job on the on the um, quote unquote good job on when you're by yourself, either by journaling, kind of having the conversation or taking the time just to think these things, feel these things through, mm -hmm. as well as have the experience, then that second level of doing this with another person will become much more easy. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I think it's worth talking and, and bringing back that knowing the yes or no, the consent and all of that into the body, because I know I've had conversations with girlfriends in the past who they've had experiences of what they thought this fantasy lit them up in their head. Mm. But then bringing it into the physical embodiment or not necessarily embodiment, but experience of it was nothing like what they expected. Right. And in that, I mean, this is not my area and special speciality of work, but in that there was definitely some dissonance between the fantasy and the actualization of it that could have been avoided so that the actualization could have been a beautiful experience, too. And or it's information to say, well, maybe that's not quite what I want. Let's see what else is there. So that curiosity, playfulness, and all of that that you mentioned, I think is, is really important. But maybe speak to that a little bit. Well, this is some of the things. So we can get caught up in the act of the fantasy. And a lot of times a fantasy can play a little bit with curiosity, which is, has to have a certain amount of, can have a certain amount of fear, anxiety of that's course. there. And as we spoke earlier, that can be kind of these end of the the spectrum the extreme sides of the spectrum of let's say if you are thinking of dominance it could be very extreme being dominated or very extreme dominating someone else let's just say that's the spectrum yes. it could yes. also be for another person being tied up versus uh, held underwater or you know i'm just bringing up different types of that spectrum of experience and when you go to your fear and you go into fantasy you start to gravitate towards that and if you make it about the action yeah then what you will reproduce is the action but instead if you were noticing kind of what the fantasy i was looking at what are the core elements that drive that fantasy is yes. it power exchange that you that you're looking for in which case then maybe you don't need to do the act of having the leather and everything else it could be just from a sapiosexual perspective that this person is very dominant with you because they're an expert in what it is that they are talking to you about yes. or it could end up being that maybe they look very physically strong so you find out like well, what are the essentials 
of yes. that fantasy. And even then, sometimes just going through it and living through the extremes of it in your personal world doesn't mean that you then have to reflect and do it out into the external world because yes. you're actually maybe just working through something that you might have some psychological tension from something that was unresolved in the past and maybe does or doesn't have a big story. Yeah. And if you can share that with a partner and knowing that the partner does not need to act on it or push you into it or take blame or take it personally around it, this can take a lot of the edge off of the whole thing about fantasy yeah. and allow for you to have explorations that maybe don't happen in the external world by bringing another other people in it could actually happen in the fantasy world with the two of you that you're kind of making love and then x fantasy gets spoken about as if it's happening right there and so yes. the two of you are crafting fantasies that you can then go where there's not such a big impact and begin to manage that and then from there you'll often find okay do i actually really want this to be something in reality or mm -hmm. no i don't want this to be in reality in the same way that you would if you want to help take a singer to reach that note that really has to push their system to the limit you'll take them out of an anxious situation so that everything can open and they can really belt into their voice and then yes. gradually bring them into okay well it's the crowd that's actually stopping you from going out there or maybe it's a physical impediment but you'll make it easy and then gradually move it that way and this is the yeah. same thing that we can do with our fantasies because again it's not about the goal or the destination yes. making yes. the fantasy happen it's about a self-exploration of oneself within that world and a general understanding of what's happening there so that way things can simply flow through and move through in a way that okay this might be something that you would love to have for the rest of your life it might be something that you never want to do it might be something you want to do once it might be something you wish to share with a partner maybe it's just something that had to work through in your mind and then but it's going to release that tension i think this is something mm -hmm. as well that we can say into orgasm what i i look at it and define it isn't the contraction it is the release of contraction and so mm -hmm. when we are expanding and we reach that kind of boundary of it we will have a physical contraction yes. uh, where maybe we can lead to a let's say clitoral orgasm or an ejaculatory orgasm and then we kind of have that peak experience where things go down but the more that we can stay in that expanded dilated state this is actually where they're finding a lot of health benefits in this relaxed arousal or this heightened state of arousal actually before the quote unquote traditional peak orgasm happens that we get a lot of the health benefits and so i would actually say that the release of contraction so that we can expand further is an orgasmic state when we all of a sudden are kind of in whatever contracted state we are we release into a bigger one all of a sudden we get into this other world of sensation which is the difference between again squeezing the pelvic floor and getting some sensation what you were describing about was the pushing out and feeling yes. this expanded state all of a sudden now you become hyper aware of everything well in the same way this can happen physically with orgasm as we start to actually the cervix dilates the womb vibrates and you have this kind of more pleasure system from womb to clitoris types of orgasm in the same way we can have that same sensation of freedom and expansion on the psychic space when we lean into these kinks where we're like oh my god why is it that i like this so much yeah and why does this <laughs> or, or why does this thing keep visiting me and i'm really not comfortable with it and the second you become comfortable with it or the second that you actually get to play with it whether whichever way it ends up going for you all of a sudden there's such a freedom of pleasure and mm -hmm. that kind of orgasm is actually one that you will walk around your day and notice a very strong difference character shift inside yes. yourself that it goes beyond just I feel physically I good, but it's, mm -hmm. I'm allowed to, I deserve, I embrace, I take, and all of a sudden a whole new reality yeah, of identity we live out into the world changes. Yeah, yeah I, I love all of that. And I think I'm just going to do one small um, summary of the piece before, because I think it's really beautiful understanding that within the fantasy, you have an opportunity to extract what it is that 
that means for you, what it tells you about yourself. It's not necessarily about acting it out or doing it. And in some cases, it might be that you do, but then you just find your way gradually towards that in all the different ways. But I love the extraction process. For me, it's like getting the tincture out and having that little bit there and know, okay, because I have, when I think about my own fantasies, I am clear on some that this isn't something I really want to live out, but I love the fantasy and I give myself permission to have it and what it means for me in my own world um learning how in the past to maybe release the shame about it or the judge self judgment like really yeah. you would want that in all of those pieces so important for us to realize that on a day to day basis we have so many different thoughts all the time why judge those that are bringing us pleasure right exactly and in this <laughs> way, like maybe your fantasies about the the mailman and you know that this is not acceptable for your relationship yeah but you do notice that that freedom and ability to be a sexual creature and mm. be fully expressed and be admired is actually what you want more than having sex with the mailman, yeah. which then your relationship, it could be that you're just allowing yourself to dress more sexually. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, well, maybe my partner is not comfortable with me having sex with the mailman, but that's yeah. not really what I want to do with my fantasy. <laughs> But my comfortable yeah. is very, my partner very much loves that I start to wear clothes that actually exude a femininity yes. and brings more yes. beauty into his life. And yes, more people admire, but I'm showing the world and him that, you know, I've chosen this guy and this is the one who gets to enjoy this beauty. All of a sudden now he becomes super exuberant and happy about this. You feel mm. vivacious inside yourself. And so it's understanding again, because you've extracted well, yes. what is the part of that fantasy of the mailman that you enjoy? Well, mm. maybe it's the fact that, you know, your husband has different capacities within which the world he lives himself out to be, which of one is what, you know, maybe he has this kind of, you know, he's a sexy guy. He goes and he could literally go to different parts of the world, deliver to different people pleasure. And That's you're right. actually embracing this aspect of him, but this isn't acceptable in either of your dynamic that he gets to be that stud in the shorts with the great calves or thighs yeah, exactly. or whatever. <laughs> and you get to be that woman that's sitting there at the door that gets like, oh my gosh, admires that. Well, if the two of you can play that out, Maybe yes. you could do a role play. Maybe it's just simply, like we said before, understanding yes. that it's changing your outfit to be better seen, but yes. extracting the important bits of what is at the essence there that is actually causing that response inside you. Mm. Then you can begin to find creative ways to explore we'll that and on the outside, inside the out outside approach all the way. And share it with a partner and do it in a way that invites them in, as yes. opposed to being frustrated about it and causing emasculation. For yeah. instance, if that was a lot of times, if a person wants the partner to be powerful, they will test them by taking that power away to hopefully be overcome Incite in a them, yeah. weird backwards way, but in reverse psychology. But the fact is, is that it's much better to be setting that person up in a position so that they feel what it's like to be powerful they get a pleasurable yes. experience mm -hmm. from it then they're going to want to continue to do that and yeah. then be very open to suggestions as well if you want to explore other areas maybe anticipation or you know yeah. making the so person much. wait for it yeah there's just there's a the whole playground and i think this is yeah. what it comes down to is that when they've done research to find what allows for long-term romance it isn't the neurotic sense of romance that you find in young romance, but it's actually the ability to have shared goals, shared common fun, and this comes through having shared hobbies. Yeah. Well, what a better hobby to do than opening up the spectrum of what it is that you can both find and express with sex, allow yes. that to become your hobby. And all of a sudden you've handled one of the big aspects, which is communication, economics and sex normally what ends relationships so if you can start to bring mm. communication and sex in it's going to free up a whole lot inside yourself but also your partnership <sighs> i mean there's just i think we definitely have to have a part two there's i have so many things that i want to pull from but i know that we are coming close to the end and i also wanted to just say from my personal experience and practice that i love how creative i am in comp composing in the work that i do working with clients when i have had an orgasm or i am have i've had an amazing self-pleasure experience and i can carry that throughout my day throughout my week as opposed to feeling that it's a moment and it's over now 
transition into work mode, it's such a beautiful thing to carry through. And I just think you you obviously pointed that out. Um, but I want to say that I love that personally. Um, it's it's how it how it helps so much in the creative world that I'm in and the work that I do. Um, yes. Some more of and that. Pleasure and orgasm as being a charge that mm -hmm. focuses us and fuels us towards what we want as opposed to yes. that distraction or itch that we scratch quickly to like fall asleep or just kind of like <laughs> now i can finally get back to work is no yeah. infuse what you do with that passion and yes. if your passion is maybe leading you towards a different line of work then maybe listen to that because yeah. that information that match between the two is i think something that's very key to our professional life our leadership life and our relational life that's amazing oh. So I'm going to go to a very simple question that I like to ask a lot of my guests, and that is, what sound do you love? Uh, <laughs> that sound. <laughs> uh, um, so or, or I could even say it's the sound when that transformation happens and we go from our regular everyday state to that deeply embodied state of pleasure and it's almost it's a tonality when the person mm -hmm. just really sinks into themselves and yeah. you feel that currency like that currency that that current coming through them mm. in the way they in the way that they speak uh that's that's a sound a quality of sound that i love to hear and and uh in a person that is amazing well, my brother, Aaron, I have to say this has been an absolute pleasure and I will be taking a lot of this yumminess into the rest of my day as well. I want to say thank you so much for joining me and us and everyone listening. I celebrate you. I celebrate all that you are and everything that you are helping others to discover and explore and integrate their sexual sovereignty. Thank you for the work you're doing in this world. Mm. Oh. Where can people find you online? I was going to say thank you so much for having me here. And I know that we get very nerdy here, but <laughs> part of the magic is actually boiling this information down to very short, digestible, practical, hands-on things that you can begin to implement immediately. Yes. And if you were to go and check out my bio link on Instagram under Suction Sex, you will find that there are very videos that you can follow along with um, for programs that are with resensitization meaning how to awaken numbness let go of pain and actually start to train yourself to have orgasmic variety wherever you are in that spectrum yeah. very quick easy low price program there's also larger ones that um, if you are a woman wanting to know how to pleasure a male partner while at the same time doing it in a way that you don't have to do an exchange of your pleasure but actually bring your pleasure fully online mm -hmm. while helping the guy be able to be to regulate his arousal you can have longer lasting pleasure figuring yes. out mental arousal that's all inside there. that's a very comprehensive program yes. as well as for the men how to be able to um, tackle different issues uh, without having to do really long trainings and understanding anatomy hand skills mouth skills and cock skills as well as for the women the vagina skills there is a free mini course even that they can do with kind of like what are the four basic things regardless of what body and who you're with that you can um begin to implement right now and check that out for free and i, I would start probably along one of any one of those there we're also doing a play shop as well on suction sex so um, they could join us live uh, i'll be working with dr saida desolet in yes. copenhagen Amazing. april 2nd and there's also even a zoom recording of a pork shop that you can do with your partner if you want to set up a sort of three-hour date where you actually would go through and start to implement a lot of these things plus Ooh, we have I two like programs. that a three-hour date mm. i know <laughs> <laughs> we have two other programs the last ones i'll mention is we are cooking up a sex gym, which is all about um, those with a female anatomy, how to use exercise in a way that doesn't cause pelvic floor atrophy, but actually allows for training the body to be prepared physically for pleasure and sex. There is a sex gym we're building, and then we're doing our first couples course where Saida and I are doing uh, a nine date course that will give you just 
quick little things that you can implement into one data at a time and also notice that you have revolutionized the experience of sex on the levels of the conceptual bi-directional sensation for suction mm. as well as then how do we actually embody different things to deal with all the stuff we've spoken about here with emotions and sensations so there's a ton out there um yes. if you want just take a look at the instagram check it yeah, out yeah and i will have all of course all of your links under this episode everywhere too so you will be able to find everything that aaron and dr saida desile who's joining him for a lot of this as well will be offering there's so much yummy stuff in this i can tell you from my own personal experience of working with them and knowing them this is a hell yes very wide open legs open arms open heart open mind open ready to explore and be creative so look out for those links below and aaron i like to ask all of my guests this final question and that is what is your soulful sound to the world a self prayer or desire that you wish upon the world my desire is that we start to bring beauty art as well as playfulness back into the act of sex and the intimacy of relationships. And this is really my passion and why I've teamed up with Saida to build specific bespoke programs to help people begin to actualize that if they're really wanting personally crafted uh, experiences that will start to align this, not in just the sense of a workshop, but how you can integrate this into your everyday daily life so that it becomes a part of your shift of reality. Transform. Oh, beautiful. Mm. How much for having me on here and allowing me to, to share and just to ping back and forth with, with our minds and talk yes. and our bodies and sounds. I've really enjoyed it, Simone. It's such a pleasure. I mean, these are the conversations we have all the time. So it just happens to be recorded this time. So I am very, very happy and honored. And I will see you again soon. Mwah! See you soon. See you, sister. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share it with your friends and remember to subscribe. From my heart to yours, sending you love, healing, and sound wherever you are.